welcome. Um, so like you said, this talk is about extending gems. So gems are kind of the foundation of how people share code in the Ruby ecosystem. Um, I work specifically on the New Relic RPM gem, so known as the Ruby agent from New Relic, if you've ever used that. And we'll talk a little bit about that just because it plays into a few of the examples. Um, and we'll kick that off with a little story. So the way that uh, New Relic, we do performance monitoring software. So you install our gem into your application. It finds all the other things that you have installed, instruments them, and you know, gets our hooks in to be able to time what's happening, and sends data back to New Relic service so we can print you pretty graphs and give you alerting and data on all of, your, uh, all, of, all of what's going on in your application. So one bit of what we do is we will actually inject a little piece of JavaScript, if you want, into your page to time how long things take on the client. And so in the agent, we had a piece of code that looked a little bit like this. Um, down at the bottom, we're generating the script tag that we're going to eventually put into your output. And then there's this mess. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. Like we're looking at what the queuing time is for something, then we're doing some math on it, then we pass it off somewhere else to do this rounding. Now this is a little ugly and probably repeated for a number of different things that we were taking these sorts of measurements for. So being good programmers and trying to keep our house tidy, we went through and we you know, extracted things and we created an object that represents those timings and takes care of all of those details within that object. Kind of slim the interface down and make it so that things are a little nicer when we need to inject that time into the JavaScript as it goes out. So. This is all a good story, but unfortunately, somewhere else at New Relic, there was a little bit of extra things going on. In our main website, so we're a client of our own, right? We install this gem to do our timing. Somebody had monkey patched the particular method that we thought was internal to our gem. We were making updates and refactoring something, thinking that there were no other clients apart from us that were relying on this particular inner piece of functionality. And in fact, we had one right in our own website. Now, fortunately, we caught this before it went to production, but this is exactly the sort of problem that you can get into when you're the author of a gem. If you have functionality that you don't expose to other people, in Ruby, it doesn't mean that they can't get to it. It just means that they might take an avenue to get to it that you're not expecting. And when you change things and update your gem, it might break stuff. So that's kind of the premise of this talk, is providing you with some insight into a lot of different ways that you can make your gem more extensible, problems that you might run into, and ways that people might try to circumvent the things that you do and how you structure your code both to make your life easier the, as the developer of a library and to protect your clients from themselves. So who knows, maybe you're wanting to make the next big web server. You know, you've got a great idea for how those things ought to run and you're ready to get in the fray with Unicorn and Puma and put your own option out there. Maybe, maybe you know how background job processing really ought to be done. Like everybody else is goofing it up. You, you've got the plan. Or maybe you just have some little piece of code that you would like to share that might be something that other people are going to want to build off of. Whatever the case is, there are points of extension that you might want to consider in how you build those things. So we're going to cover a lot of different kind of small pieces, um, things all the way from tiny little code patterns all the way up to architectural things about how you lay your gem out. Um, We'll talk about passing in objects and how you can make the surface of your gem extensible through what you allow it to put in. We'll talk about events. We'll talk about the middleware pattern and how that can be really powerful. We'll talk about the life cycle of, of an application. Some gems you might be shipping an executable and that brings a whole host of other issues along with it. And lastly, we'll talk about names and paths, configuration and documentation. All of these things can make it easier or harder for people to effectively extend things in ways that you might not have planned for as the author of a gem. All right, so let's start off with passing things in. Ruby is an object-oriented language. The most natural thing in the world for it is to have objects that represent some piece of information or functionality and to pass those around to different parts of the system so that they can be interacted with. And that's the, the basic foundation for how you can allow other people into your gym and to influence the behavior of what's going on. A great example of this 
is loggers. So we'll take our first example uh, from an existing library, and it's actually the only good example that we take from Rails. Um, it's the only example I have from Rails, so not to. But Active Record um, allows you to set the logger that it will use for outputting all of its information. So when you see you know, your query streaming by on your development log, that's because there's a default logger that's set up by Rails to take that information. But they've just exposed that, that uh, property, that method, right on the top so that it's easy for somebody to get to, easy for you to override and change what that behavior is. In some spheres, you might have heard this sort of thing referred to as dependency injection. But if you're like me, that makes me think of all sorts of complicated machinery and you know, XML configuration and factories in Java. That it doesn't have to be. Dependency injection just means letting someone else pass in the dependencies that you have. And so something like a logger is a really great place to do that. Ruby supports this very well because of duct typing, because objects are so dynamic you can simply send it a message. And if it responds to it properly, then you're good. This can be a pitfall for you as an author of a gem, though, because if there is a point in time that you're expecting other people to pass an object in, how do you know that it properly supports the things that you want? And how does that person writing that extension know what you're expecting? This is somewhere where it's really good to provide some sort of specs, either written specs or even better automated specs that can be run to validate something about the behavior and nature of the objects that you're expecting to be passed in. Now, in the case here of a logger, that's a well-understood interface. You know, it's in the standard library, so you just make your logger match that interface and everything's happy. But if you've got a more custom object that you're wanting people to be able to depend on, you might consider doing that sort of specking to help them out. Loggers are not the only case, though, for things that you can pass in, not by a long shot. And one that's near and dear to my heart is instrumenters. Um, the XCon library is an HTTP client library, so you can use it instead of NetHttp, which ships with Ruby, to make uh, calls to web services in various places. And it provides this really nice thing when you instantiate the, collect, the connection to say, hey, instrument the calls that you make. Now, this instrumenter is just a very basic object that you provide with an instrument method that will get called by XCON to wrap around any time it does a call. And so you can do things like logging or timing of what's going on, um, handling of errors, anything that you need to around the calls that you're making to those external services. Now, this is really nice. I love seeing when libraries have thought about the fact that people might want to wrap things around what's happening and put that sort of timing infrastructure in place. But there's a small problem with how this was done. You notice that we passed in one instrumenter. What happens if you pass in another later on? It's going to get trumped. That single instance of an instrumenter that XCON exposes is a piece of state that whoever the last person is to try and set what the instrumenter is is the person that wins. So we came around to instrument this library at New Relic. And we found that although they had gone to great pains to provide an instrumentation framework, a way for you to get in there, we couldn't safely use it because we couldn't count on whether some other party, either the application itself or some other gem, had already used that instrumenter. And so we had to take some other techniques to be able to get it done. This is going to be a little bit of a recurring theme that we'll see. Anytime that there is a single instance of something that you're expecting to let external people fiddle with and mess with in your gym, you're opening up the door to having that get trumped by multiple callers that you may not expect. Another great place to provide a way for passing things in is for backends that provide data. Delayed job is uh, one of the well-known uh, background job processing frameworks in Ruby. So it works like this. If we had a user class that had an activate method, you could instead call user.delay activate. And what delayed job does is it takes a, that call that you tried to make, packages it up, puts it in the background, and then goes and processes it later in a separate uh, process. Now, delayed job started life out writing that stuff just directly into your database using active record. But at some point along the way, they realized that people might want to store things in different locations. And so they actually built a structure in 
to support that through gems that allow you to plug a different data back in into that job processing. Um, so delayed job active record is an example of that. There's one, I think there was one for Mongo. There might have been one for Data Mapper. You know, this is a great thing. Not counting on people using the particular data access technology that you're using and giving them the spot to be able to say, hey, go get this information from over here, really opens the doors up a lot. They did a little bit of weird stuff in here, though, with the way that they structured it. And in particular, this is one of the lines that, uh, that caused us a little bit of issue at New Relic when we were instrumenting some of these things. So what this ha does is once it had loaded up a back end within delayed job, it reassigned so the delayed job constant was that same, is basically an alias to what that back end was. Now, the end result was that that made it really difficult for us to tell whether we were in the presence of the active record adapter or not and what the right thing was to do because delayed job, if we had the active record adapter, this was a perfectly valid call to make. But some of the other adapters, we couldn't call count or maybe a count method was there but it didn't take the same parameters. So having a clear boundary between those back ends and the core of your system can give a little better signal to people that might be reading your objects and uh, trying to interact with your library. So these are a couple of sort of broad patterns of things that you might pass in. There's also a lot of different very gym specific things that you might do within the domain of what your gym is trying to accomplish. Rescue is a great case for this. So with rescue, you create a class that has a perform method. So rescue is a background job processor, a lot like delayed job, but instead of taking arbitrary methods and putting that delay on it, you create a class that you then pass in and then you can enqueue a job by telling it that particular class to use and handing it the parameters. This gets uh, serialized onto a Redis backend and then processed by another process um, a rescue worker out of band. So this is a place where rescue has said, hey, we're not going to assume that we know what a job should be. You tell us what your job is. You pass that in to us and we'll deal with it from there. They also provided a really nice surface area for this for allowing you to get into the cycle of how that object then gets interacted with. So any method that is on that job class that's prepended with before underscore or after underscore will be executed by rescues processing in the course of ex uh, running that job. Now this is really nice to have because then you can name things in a way that's very flexible, very you know, semantic to what you're wanting to do. Um, and they also documented what all of these hooks are in the form of how you need to name those methods, which is really important, and we'll talk about that a little more later. So that's passing objects in. That's kind of the primary interface for letting people interact with your gym and tell you where to get different information or how to behave differently. But it's not the only pattern and the only way for us to accomplish what we want to. Evented patterns are another great way of allowing people to get interjected into the life cycle of what happens in your gym without them necessarily having to know anything about your object structures. So I'll just, uh, this is gonna be a fairly brief section. I'll make a, a plug that I actually have an entire talk that's based around this that I gave at RailsConf um, earlier this year that digs into a lot more details about the ways that you can implement this, how you can do it simply, and the uh, possible implementations that already exist. Rails has an eventing framework. And so if you're writing in a Rails application or your gym is specifically for that setting, um, you may be able to just use some of those technologies that are already present. But in the, the basic shape of it, what you do with your, um, your gym, if you want to expose events, is give them a method and allow them to call that with a block. And that block is what gets executed at the time that uh, that, that event fires. So rescue, um, part of its functionality is that it is a forking job processor. So there's a master process and then each time it wants to run a job it forks a new copy of that process and then runs. And sometimes you might need to get in there and do particular sorts of work in that child process before the job gets to run. You may need to do things like reestablish database connections, uh, close file handles from the parent, do some sort of setup or cleanup. 
So Rescue provides an after fork. They expose it directly on their top level module, which I think is a pretty good place for it. This makes it so you don't have to go looking deeply. You don't have to understand some big method structure or how to make an object for it. You just call after fork, give it the block for what needs to happen, and then that gets called at the appropriate point in time. But as you might imagine, this had a little bit of a flaw for a long time. There was only one after fork hook in rescue up until a version eh, about a year ago. And what this meant was if somebody had the code that I had shown you in that application previously and then New Relic, for instance, came along and needed to do something in the after four hook, we either weren't allowed to touch it because somebody's already registered a hook or we would register it and then your hook doesn't get to run. If you've only got one of something you're in a lot of peril that those third parties, those people externally, are going to tromp on each other when they're trying to use it. Now, th the ending of this story was that they eventually fixed that and made it so that you could subscribe multiple after and before fork hooks. And the thing that I love about it is that the interface for that was this. They changed the internal behavior of after fork, so instead of holding on to one block, it just put it into an array. And so clients didn't actually have to change their code to take advantage of this behavior. It's something to consider anytime you have that sort of interface. If you are, if it makes sense that there should only be one, or if there should be allowed multiple clients that might want to do the same thing, and avoid people tromping on each other, as a result. So that's events. There's a lot more there. There's a lot of ways that you can structure things. Um, to kind of keep pieces decoupled and a lot of benefits to testing. But for a gem author especially, having that external interface that you can publish those events on is really powerful. So let's talk about another pattern. And that's the middleware pattern. So this is probably most familiar uh, to Ruby developers from Rack. So Rack is the basis of uh, the vast majority of Ruby web servers that run out there. Um, it has, allows for uh, kind of layering of different middleware classes that handle different responsibilities in handling a web request. So in this, uh, in this picture, you can imagine a request comes in from the outside, and then it goes down through each of these different app, uh, middlewares until it reaches your application, and then it percolates back up through that stack and out. Rack is actually very slim in what it requires in terms of the code for someone to qualify as a, as a middleware. So the primary interface for it is a method called call that takes a single parameter, which is a hash of the environment. And that's all the data that's coming in from the outside world to be passed through that. A middleware is expected to also know what, app, what the next layer is. So basically, it can call on to that next thing, or it can handle it itself. Um, and then it can modify the results that are coming back. So if you wanted to do something like caching, maybe you'd find the thing in your cache and you would return instead of calling down into the later stages of your middleware. But for somebody who's writing uh, their own libraries or their own extensible uh, pieces of code, there's a little bit of peril here with this because that's just a hash. And there's a lot of people between you and the outside world. Like this is the default Rack's uh, stack with a Rails application. And actually, I'll give a small plug. We just this week released a new version of the Ruby agent that I work on that instruments these middlewares. So that's where I know intimately a lot about how many layers there are, because there's, there's a lot of them. And any one of those particular layers could be doing something to that environment that you may not be expecting. So the middleware pattern is really great for allowing kind of um, composition of these different pieces of functionality. But for third parties, for clients that might want to be getting into that, uh, that stack of middlewares, there's a little bit of a gap in the way that Rack does it. It's very simple, but it doesn't allow for a lot of introspection. Each middleware only knows about the next middleware that it's supposed to pass things on to. And in the presence of Rails, it has some things that you can inspect some part of the Rack stack, but it doesn't give you everything and it's not built into Rack itself. So for a, a person like myself who's wanting to write code that might want to be very careful about where we inject ourselves into a middleware stack, um, that lack of introspection is kind of problematic in how this is structured. So 
Rack is not the only instance of a middleware stack that's out there, though. Uh, Sidekick is a background job processing framework. Everybody loves making new background job processing frameworks, apparently. It's a very popular pastime. Um, and they use the middleware pattern to great effect to allow you to add things in, both on the enqueuing side of putting a job in and on the server side of processing it. So a sidekick middleware looks a lot like this, takes some basic initialization. Very similar to Rack, it has a call, although it takes more parameters than just that raw environment. So you get your worker, your message, and your queue, and I think that even has changed in uh, some later versions. And you take the work that you need to do, and nicely, rather than you having to track the next layer, you simply yield. And sidekick sets things up so that goes through to the right place. Now, part of what I really love about the way Sidekick has done their middlewares, though, is that it's fully configurable. Because it's not through each middleware knowing who the next one is, you can see the entire server middleware chain. That's an array. You can look at it. You can iterate over it. You can work with that directly. And so for people being able to extend the middlewares that are in Sidekick, this is a really powerful way for it to be structured versus how Rack has done it more simply. So that's middlewares. Very often, if you've got kind of a request response sort of uh, life cycle or like a background job, something where there's uh, places where people might want to get in before and after what's happening, maybe middlewares would make sense for you. So let's talk about life cycle. So this moves on a little bit into a slightly different class of gym where you're not just writing a library, you're writing something that has an executable that's associated with it, whether that's a web server or some sort of other service, some sort of job processor. And a lot of the problems that you run into revolve around forking and demonization. We've run into this a lot at New Relic because of uh, a couple of uh, snarls that come in when you're dealing with these sorts of uh, forking environments that we'll go through. But just to make sure that we're all on the same page, when I talk about forking, we have a process. Imagine that this box is a process and the arrow there is a thread in that process that's executing. And there is some state of the world, all of the variables, all of the memory, everything that's there in our process. And when we call the fork method on one of those threads, what happens is the operating system makes us a brand new process, has a different process ID, but otherwise the state of the world in that new child process is identical to the parent that we were coming from. And execution in both the parent and the child continues on from that point where we called fork. It gives a little bit of information back so you can tell whether you're in the parent or the child after the fork call, but um, in practice they're both essentially copies of the same process. The operating system does some great things under the covers to make this very lightweight. And so this is a very common way to do things like um, spin up new workers within your web server. Unicorn takes that sort of approach. Now, it's really nice if you are writing something that does this sort of forking to provide hooks before and after, like we saw Rescue does. And there's some really particular reasons why that's critical. Ruby doesn't provide anything that tells you and let you subscribe at, at kind of the language level to knowing that something has forked. And I actually just lied to you when I said that all of the state comes across when you fork. If you're running in some sort of multi-threaded process, so in this case we've got our, our forking thread up there at the top, but we had some other, process, uh, some other threads that were running. After the fork, there's only the one. The one thread that called fork is the only one that continues executing. And so if those other threads were doing something meaningful, then they vanish when you get into the fork and somebody needs to reestablish them and start that work back up. Now this is particularly pertinent to me, uh, as you might imagine working for New Relic, because part of how the gym works is that we spin up a background thread and that's where all the communication back to our service happens. So if we've started up in a process and then that process forks and our background thread goes away, you lose your data. We can't communicate back. And if we don't have a hook in time to know that that fork has occurred, we can't restart our background thread. Like our, our code isn't running anymore. There's nowhere for us to notice that this has happened and kickstart things. The picture can get even nastier though if you are using threads because of synchronization issues and occasional problems that you run into at that level. So if you can imagine, we've got a, our multi-threaded setup again, and then on one of these background threads, we're holding on to a lock. Like we've taken a mutex and we've acquired that. 
and then a fork happens on that first thread. Well, the lock gets copied over to that new process. And so if it's in a global or in some space where somebody else can see it, apart from just the thread that was executing and had that lock, then that lock is still maintained. It's still held in that child process. But the thread that was running that was going to let go of it when it was done doesn't exist anymore. So that child process, if it ever tries to do something that requires it to take that lock, you're deadlocked. Your process is going to stop. It's not going to carry on. Now, if you want to read more about this, there's a great thread that um, I started on the rescue project. And a lot of other people have chimed in and gone to great lengths to avoid and find these sorts of issues. They're, they've gone so far as to patch Ruby and find deadlocks and bugs at the VM level from these sorts of issues. So as a gem author, if you're writing something that's going to fork, that's going to demonize, um, you might want to take into consideration allowing those sorts of hooks, and you might want to be really careful um, about it, because it's definitely more complicated than it seems like it is on the surface. But if you're writing an application, you're writing something uh, that runs other people's code, that's not the only consideration that you might have. If you load someone else's environment, the ordering and timing of when that happens might also be kind of important. So Unicorn is a popular web server in the Ruby space. It works by running a master process, and then it forks off copies of, the, uh, of itself to actually handle requests. And so each of those individual process, the children, are what actually takes the requests in. Now, Unicorn provides a couple of different modes for you that change when it loads your application you can have the preloading of the app, and that means that that single master process, before it forks anything off, is going to load all of your code. It's going to load your Rails application, all your gems. And then we fork, and then we call some hooks and carry on, uh, get into the loop that the web server is going to run down in the child. But you can choose not to do that, and that changes the order that things happen in. So instead, we fire our after fork, we get our loop started, and then it loads the gems. Now, this kind of matters because the point in time when a particular library might get loaded can vary dramatically depending on what this setting is. And so we ran into this with New Relic because we wanted to patch that loop. That was the point that we needed to instrument and get ourselves into. But if somebody was preloading false, we weren't loaded until after that had happened. So taking some care about when you load gems, if you're an application, when you call those things on behalf of your, uh, your client code can help save some problems down the line. How did you solve that? Um, ask people to do preload true <laughs> most of the time. And we did eventually find um, a couple of other hooks for t points in time that happened later on. Um, that we could use to kickstart our thread in the background. Um, it's not as seamless as we'd like because it requires that somebody actually make a web request before we can actually start things up, where what we had done previously, we would be started already. Um, so I don't know if that made any sense. I'd be happy to chat through it in a little more detail if you want afterwards. So names and paths. There's a big movement in Ruby, started a lot with Rails of, you know, um, convention over configuration. The idea of, you know, making things implicit and making things simple at that level. But, you know, there's another sort of way of viewing that. And that's that it kind of forces naming onto people. It kind of forces you to fit yourself to the, the shape of what the library is that you're using. Now, if this is Rails, that's awesome. It smooths the way. And you're, you know, you're choosing to write a Rails application. You're going you're gonna to go along with their conventions. But if you're writing another library, you're writing a smaller sort of thing, you, know, you might not be able to force people into doing exactly what you want and uh, naming and locating things in the places that you might think. So we love the SQL library. It's an awesome ORM in Ruby. And it actually provides a really great extension model for allowing people to write things that plug into it. Um, it looks a lot like this. You say SQL plugin and then give it a symbol for the name. And what that ends up doing is it eventually resolves to a require that looks something like this. Now, that's pretty slick. It's a really nice interface that it's got there at the top. 
But there is a little bit of downside if you're a library author and you want to write something that plugs into SQL. And maybe I'm just silly and maybe I just like to have things be clean. But okay, here's the root directory for the gem that I work on. New Relic, kind of makes sense. New Relic RPM, that's our main file. Tasks, okay, stuff for rake and SQL. Like the naming that it has provided, the way that it assumes that it's going to load the plugins, forces me to put something at my top level namespacing because that's where it's going to find it. You know, this may work well for some situations, like if this was purely a SQL plugin, that would be great. Um, but it would have been really nice if you were able to pass directly the thing that you were wanting to use. Not make that assumption of the requirement and the pathing that's there. I'm sure there are probably other, other issues around this. I don't know that I know all the reasons that it was done that way, but providing those options and letting people dictate those sorts of things directly, letting them tell you what to load rather than loading it for them, can sometimes help avoid problems. Another thing that I've seen a lot of is generic naming. So I'm going to write a, a, uh, an implementation of the active record pattern. I'm going to name the gem active record. I'm going to write a data mapper. I'm going to write an HTTP client library. Like, I understand that naming is hard. And actually, sometimes we get made fun of in, in the Ruby space for naming things really cleverly or in ways that don't make any sense. But you, know, you make things a little muddy when you take the pattern that you are implementing or the technology that you are dealing with, and then you name your gem exactly what that is. I know we, mo we instrument four or five different HTTP client libraries. And it's really confusing that one of them is HTTP client, like that that's the name of it. So, you know, do us a favor, maybe put a little bit of effort into finding a, a little clever name or at least something that might be a little more unique if you're coming up with your libraries. I've also seen issues with naming around qualification. And this um, especially comes in around some of the standard library things. So here's a a problem that I introduced in the agent, and we've since removed a lot of this and changed things around. But you know, we wanted to do some extra things around how we started up all of our background threads. So I thought, hey, we'll you know derive our own thread class. That's fine. You know, we'll do that. It gets all the the functionality, and then we can provide the little bit of extra that we want along the way. Well, this was all well and good, and seemed like it made sense. But somebody out there in the wide world did this they open the class thread. And it happened to be that this was getting loaded in a context where it did not find the standard library thread, it found new relic agent thread. If you're writing a library and you're dealing with a lot of the standard library classes and doing things like this, doing operations that care very deeply about you know, what class it is that you're actually talking to, you might want to consider fully qualifying them to make sure that you're talking about the class that you think you're talking about. Ruby's module system is awesome and provides tons of flexibility, but it can also bite you if you're not really careful about what you're doing. And for library authors, I think in particular, um, that can matter. We've made some similar uh, goofs in some other spots as well. So this one was embarrassing because it was between two gems that New Relic has. So the plugin is for people writing platform plugins, a sort of separate thing. And they had New Relic Logger. Hey, that seems great, right? And then in the Ruby agent gem, we had a place where we're in the new relic module and then we're down in a couple of other things and then we refer to logger debug. Well, guess what logger that finds? It looks up the chain and it found new relic logger rather than the standard library logger. Like, I know the code is not as pretty, but if we had just qualified it, we would have gotten exactly what we expected to. And this has bit me just enough times that I'm really a fan of making sure that you qualify things. It's just going to save you pain down the, uh, down the road, even though you might think you know where things are getting loaded from otherwise. So that's naming and paths. A lot of stuff there. Let's talk briefly about configuration. So one of the primary ways that you configure applications and gems in Ruby is through the YAML format. And I actually really like it for that. It's pretty simple. It's straightforward gives you a lot of uh, flexibility with your key value pairs. Um, you can mix it with a little bit of ERB as well if you want things to be a little more dynamic in how you load it. So that would look a little bit like this. So we would load up our YAML file for our, uh, our value. If there are default values or, or things that we want to pass along into the environment, we can 
make those local variables, and then use ERB to uh, evaluate that YAML file. That allows people to put YAM, uh, ERB syntax and do some sort of substitutions in there. But if there's none of that in the file, it just resolves to the same thing. And then eventually, after we've done that transformation, we just load the YAML up. This looks like that. You can see default awesome key there was provided by that local environment that we were loading it from. Or people can write whatever Ruby code they want to in there. Now this is pretty good. Um, this, this works for a lot of cases. YAML's gotten a bad rap for some places where it was misapplied, but I think this is actually where it fits, um, is in configuration. But there's another language that's come on the scene for doing configuration that you might want to consider, and that's Ruby itself. This has been done in a couple of popular places like Unicorn, where you call methods. It provides a little DSL to let you do that configuration. But then you can also do things that are dynamic, like actually defining your hooks and running code or conditionally doing things within that Ruby file. Puma has a similar sort of thing. This is uh, the moral equivalent of that active record base uh, call that was being made before. But one of the hard parts about that is that this is really nice for applications, but there's not a nice way to access this from the runtime, from another gem. So we needed to do some instrumentation on Puma and don't get too scared. The point is that this is what we had to go through to try to get to it. And it relies on one particular mode of startup for Puma because they didn't really expose this configuration as something within the app. They expected the only clients that were going to interact with it was the application running that config file. It was really hard to get our hooks into it and get to the place that we wanted to. We managed and we've changed things since to be more seamless, but you know, think about the case of, is somebody going to want to access your configuration at runtime and not just setting it through the file that you're going to be loading? So that's configuring your stuff. Let's talk for a moment about documentation. Almost everyone knows that a, a proper readme for your project is really important. You know, take a little bit of inspiration from Sinatra. You know, they've got a readme, you get right there, and it has a table of contents that tells you what everything is. And even more of everything and even more and even more. Okay, I'm not sure if I would necessarily cram everything in the README like they did. But think about what you want people to know. Where are they going to, they're going to look at the README first, and what are the important things that you want to convey to them. And especially, I think that that applies around expected extension points. So, like a lot of the hooks and the patterns that we've talked about, if you've done those things, make sure that they're surfaced somewhere that people are going to find them. Because otherwise, they might just look at the code and try to patch things in. A great example of this is Sidekick. Uh, Mike Perm has done a really great job of keeping up to date a wiki that provides all of this information. You can see it tells you about error handling and extensions and how to write middlewares for it. Like all of this stuff is spelled out so you know what's there and what's supported in a really simple way. Don't bury the information that people need to know about how to interact with your gem. I'll give a counter example. Uh, this is what the new Relic documentation that was auto-generated off of our gem used to look like. Do you have any idea which of those classes you're supposed to interact with as, as somebody trying to work with the gym from outside? It was kind of useless to have all of that stuff. So we strimmed, stripped it down. It's not complete now. It doesn't tell you all of the classes and everything that's there. But the things that are there are things you might actually want to care about. Quick plug as well for versioning. Versioning is part of your documentation. If people are writing extensions to your gems, they're going to care about the versions and the features that are in there. And using semantic versioning is a really great way to manage that and clearly communicate things about what is available. Um, it's OK, I guess, if I just have to know that 0.47 is the version of the gem that you have that happens to have this feature that I need. But it's a lot clearer if that's in 2.0 because it was a major addition. So. That's documentation, and that's a whole bunch of stuff that we've gone through. We've talked about passing objects in. We've talked about using evented patterns and middlewares. We've talked about running a whole application and what the life cycle of that is and some of the pitfalls, how you can name things better and avoid uh, module collisions, and how to configure and document your stuff. Thank you. So I was running a little long, but I probably have a 
couple of minutes for questions if anyone had any. Right. Um, so what we actually ended up doing, I think, is we probably did some sort of patching at a different layer in the library. Um, like, is you know, at New Relic we do that for a number of different things. So we've basically done alias method chaining around some piece of the library and are just very, very cautious about what versions we do it on. Um, so we kind of had to take something that was not going to potentially get um, tromped on by somebody else's configuration. So we've talked, and I'm not sure if we did in that case, there have been uh, spots where we've then made fixes to support multiple uh, things and then contributed those back to those projects. I'm not sure if we did with XCon, um, but that ended up being the best resolution that we could do to actually accomplish what we needed to. So not, not the perfect ideal world. Um, we haven't really run into that. So most of the event hooks that we provide tend to be for the lifetime of the application. Um, I know that like active support notifications, they kind of discourage you from doing things that require you to register and unregister events a lot. Um, and I think it's exactly because it's kind of hard to identify them and it also had some performance impacts on some of the caching and things that they do. Um, so. It's possible, you know, you would just need to have an identifier probably returned from the event would be the best way to do it. So you could uh, uniquely find that to remove it later, but uh, not something that we've done a lot of. All right. Thank you. <laughs>